All right, hey, and welcome everyone. We're so glad that you're here. I'm joining uh, our crew in the sanctuary right now. I've got a message for our entire church family. So I'm coming at, uh, last week we went the other way. This week we're coming to you all, kind of a twofold sermon. I'm gonna speak to our graduates. Y'all are just kind of listening in, okay? And then uh, we're gonna talk a bit about uh, this, this generation. And as a church that's always constantly passing the gospel on to the next generation, because if we don't pass it on to the future, we don't have a future. And so today I thought, you know, I could wear my letter jacket. Still fits. <laughs> it was a little big when I was in high school. So um, you might be thinking, Jeff, how, like, how did you get a letter jacket? Like, what did you do, actually? Um, I was actually a soccer player, okay? And um, we, we went to the state championship game when I was a senior in high school. And we lost in double overtime in a shootout. And I'm over it. <laughs> Been over it for a long time. Actually, I, you know, this, this jacket, when I wore it, you know, quite a bit because uh, I was, you know, the athlete and all that. I wanted to, I really was. That was kind of my thing. I was, a, I, was a, I was a soccer player. I was an artist. I got some awards in art and among other things. I was involved in leadership. But then I went off to college, right? And I went off to university about four or five hours away. And I left behind my best friend that I grew up with from the time we were two years old. Left my, my church friends, my, my Christian friends. I was really involved in young life. I met all these friends. I was dating this girl, left, gone. Everything that was like my high school years and a lot of years. I lived in the same house all those years. Gone. And I got to college. And then I realized that none of this mattered. Like nobody cared. I, I was not like known as like the, you know, the, the soccer player or the guy that did this or that. Nobody I got to college, and nobody cared about what I did in high school. So seniors, uh, welcome to church. <laughs> We're glad that you're here. So it begs the question, though, doesn't it? What matters? What matters? And that's what we're going to talk about today. Because what I want you to see today is that, and you'd expect this from your pastor, okay? Jesus matters. And Jesus is all that matters. And I want to talk about what does that mean? Because today we're going to look at how Jesus matters because in Jesus we find our purpose. In him we find our identity. In him we find our peace. What do you need more than peace in the world today? So we're going to be looking at the book of Acts. And if you want to turn there, we'll get there in a bit. But let me just set up this sermon by talking about this generation. Now, seniors, you all know who you are, but let's, for the rest of us, um, this is the graduating class of 2021. Uh, this class uh, has read about Y2K, or heard about it, maybe. They've read about and certainly been impacted by 9-11. All happened before they were born. This crew was born in 2003, 2004, some of them maybe. Uh, 2003, friends had their last episode on what a thing called network television. <laughs> and uh, and understand there's a reunion coming back. These people are old now, right? Um, but uh, that was the thing. This class has never known a world without an iPhone. I mean, it, was, it came about 2007. They were like three years old. They've never lugged around, how about this, two devices for like music, like an iPod and a phone, like a barbarian. <laughs> They've never done that. They've never known a world without Harry Potter. They've never known a world without... How about this? The Razor phone came out when, this, when y'all were born. You remember the Razor phone? Not the graduates, but the rest of us. Um, so they've never had to take their pictures somewhere, like Walgreens or something, and wait for them to be printed. They've never had to use like the red envelope with Netflix. Not really. Never been to Blockbuster, you know, or didn't, didn't need to go to Blockbuster. Yeah, Sorry. Um, this generation, of course, Gen Z, all born, Gen Z is all, everybody born be, uh, before or after 90, 96. And now they represent about 25% of the population, Gen Z. And uh, quite, quite a voting block, uh, in, even in this past election. But this generation is now, the, this graduating class, the most diverse graduating class in the history of America. And it continues to be that way, Right. In fact, for them, diversity is not an option. In fact, it's strange. 
for most of their classmates across America to go into a place where it's not ethnically, ethnically diverse, uh, religiously diverse, all kinds of different thoughts and ideologies and people coming from all kinds of different places. One out of 10 of them expect, or are now currently self-employed because of uh, you know, gig economy startups and all kinds of things. 42% when graduating from college want to be self-employed because this generation has decided, I am king. I'm the boss of my life. And experiences are more important than belongings. In fact, their spending habits prove that. They are a finicky and picky group. There's an appendix to everything that they buy and order. From their um, sugar-free vanilla latte, (laughs) almond milk, uh, oat milk, you know, whatever it is, they, they're, you know, they're more vegan, they're more, they got more gluten-free, they're more options than any group. One study said that this group, four traits, that, uh, four group traits that characterize these young people. One, pressured, anybody? Skeptical, recognition-seeking, that's what social media does for you, and self-expression. And among most of them, there is no true authority. And I realize I'm speaking to a lot of Christian students, but for most of the classmates that you'll encounter on the college campus, if that's your next step, most have no authority at all. So watch this. No, there is an authority. What I mean is you can claim there's no authority, but what happens and what we see now is that the autonomous self has become the authority. There's some authority. You are giving your life to some authority in your life. And most in this generation have said, there's really no, no absolute truth. There's no truth outside of me. So I am king, queen, they, them. I am king of my life. I, I, I'm God in the end is where that plays out. David Kinnaman wrote a book called Fate for Exiles. I've referenced this book this past summer, especially when we were walking through the book of, of uh, Daniel, where we were talking about living in exile. Uh, and, and, and Faith in Exile, the subtitle of the book is Five Ways for a New Generation to Follow Jesus in Digital Babylon. He, he, he calls it Digital Babylon, that Christians are now in exile, being guided and spiritually formed by our screens. We talk about this a lot, but it's, it's happening, particularly with this generation. And he says that algorithms, surveillance capitalism, and all of those things now are the emperor of Digital Babylon. Guiding our thoughts and our minds if we're not discerning. I'm going to talk about that today. He describes digital Babylon as accelerated, complex culture that is marked by phenomenal access, unknown to to your parents and everybody before you, profound alienation in an ironic twist of seeking to connect, and a crisis of authority. And Kinnaman, he wrote a couple of books that I've also read prior to this book where he was talking about why all this generation, you know, the millennials in particular back in the day, now it's Gen Z, but why so many are leaving the church. And he wrote a couple of books about that and noted why that's the case. Things like, well, the Christian, you know, Christian ideologies that are really attached to political partisanship and not biblical truth. And, and, and and it's like, wow, this, this cannot be the way of Jesus. Some of what I'm seeing here. And, and among other things, but he writes about that. And then in this book, he writes not about so much why many are leaving the church, but why are they staying? Why are some staying? Then let that inform how we as a church make disciples all through our family ministry team. We talk about this all the time. How we go from birth, we dedicated some children last week before the Lord, how we go from that through elementary age, all the way middle school, high school, and into college, sending our students off today as missionaries into the world. So I want to talk about this today. In Faith for Exiles, he asked why some are staying. He says this, that student, these, these were students 18, the research was 18 through 29, all based on research. So a little bit older than our students, but they grew up Christian. Okay, keep this in mind. They grew up in the church, sort of. Okay, and here's what he says. He has a fourfold typology. Okay, fancy way to say four types of young adults now going into the world. He calls them uh, prodigals, the first 22%. These are those who do not identify as Christian at all. They grew up in church, don't identify as Christian at all now. 
I would say they never were Christian. Okay, that's the case, right? Nomads, 30%, identify as Christian, but have not attended church during the past month. Okay, so connection to a local church, not a big deal. 30%, they're nomads. I'm Christian, but don't do the church thing. And then 38% are habitual churchgoers. They describe themselves as Christians and have attended church at least once in the past month. But watch this. They do not meet foundational core beliefs or behaviors associated with being a disciple of Jesus. You're left with 10% that are resilient disciples. And I'm believing that we are sending out our students as resilient disciples. That's our goal as a church. And here's what he says. These are Christ followers who, watch this, attend church, students, check this out, attend attend church at least monthly and engage with their church in more than just going to a worship service. Secondly, trust firmly in the authority of the Bible. Thirdly, are committed to Jesus personally and affirm he was crucified, dead and buried and raised up, conquering death and hell and and, and conquering sin on our behalf so that we can do the same by the power of his spirit. Okay, And then fourth, they desire to transform the broader society as a result of their faith, that it actually has an impact. Wherever God places them, wherever he sends them. So faith for exile drills down deeper into the quantitative, qualitative data that, that helps underlie all this research. And so what he's done, hang with me, he's identified five practices that characterize resilient disciples. Okay, So parents, take notes. This is what we're seeking to do before the child graduates from, from high school. All right? So I want to talk about this is where we get to all that matters. All that matters. And we'll get to the text here in just a moment. Here's, here's what they're doing. In, in order to, and this is guides us as a church, in order to form resilient disciples, they must experience intimacy with Jesus and find their identity in him. That's the first thing that, that the research showed. In a complex and ancient, anxious age, they need to develop muscles of spiritual and cultural discernment. Not just taking in whatever they see on the news or whatever they're reading on whatever, but instead be guided by the word of God and the way of Jesus. Thirdly, when isolation and mistrust are norms, to forge meaningful, and I love this, intergenerational relationships. So we seek to do a good job, and we can do a better job, of cross-generational impact with our children and our students, our high school students. And, and, you know, it's why we have adults that are leading in crew groups and small groups and why we have others who are speaking into their lives. And then, it's, and then he says, to ground and motivate an ambitious generation, which they are, train for vocational discipleship, meaning discern your calling from God, especially in the workplace, and realize that that's where your mission, your life is lived out to the glory of God. And then he says this, curb entitlement. And self-centered tendencies by engaging in counter-cultural mission. Living as a faithful presence, trusting God to live in a different counter-cultural way according to norms that we see. That's how we stand out in the world. So that's a lot. There's a lot of research there, but I just wanted to launch into that. And then from that, to now go to to the text. Because I want to talk about all that matters. And all that matters is Jesus. And then you'd expect your pastor to say that, I suppose. But in him, we find our purpose. In him, we find our identity. In him, we find our peace. And that's what you need in all of life. This message is to our graduates. Everybody listen in. Turn to Acts 4, and I want you to hear this. We're we're talking about this beginning of the movement. Uh, We've been in this uh, pattern here for uh, several weeks. And the first thing I want you to see here is in Jesus, we find our purpose So everybody, turn to, if you have your scripture, the Bible there, turn to Acts 4 there in the sanctuary, if you'll turn to Acts 4. Now we've placed this, uh, again, in context. We, a couple weeks ago, we looked at uh, chapter 3, and here we saw Peter and John, they have healed this man, and it's causing quite a stir, and uh, so now they're talking to the people about it, and kind of in mid-sermon, if you will, it says this, chapter 4, verse 1, and as they were speaking to the people, the priest and The captain of the temple and the Sadducees, so all these religious leaders, came upon them greatly annoyed. 
because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. So the apostles had found a new purpose in life. They've been transformed by Jesus, and all they wanted to do then was let everybody know they could be set free as well, just as they had been from their sin, no longer identified as, as those who had to, to work their way to God as if we could do that. Instead, they wanted everybody to know. And it all took place because of Jesus and the resurrection. This is our purpose. And students, as you go as ambassadors, that's Paul's word, as agents into the world to tell people about the love of Jesus, to live it out. You're going on to the college campus or into the workforce, wherever you might find yourself, to live out this purpose. But look what happens. I'm going to be straight up honest with you today. Look at what happens. The religious leaders were greatly annoyed. In our day, that now the, the religious leaders, these were like the, the elite, the, you know, the good godly people. In our day, I see this a lot. It's Christendom up against Christianity. It's Christendom up against true biblical Christianity. I've seen this. You go the way of Jesus. You speak truth from God's word, and there will be those who are Christians who will stand against you if you follow the way of Jesus. But here's the thing. If you're going to live this way, live out the purpose of God for your life, which is to ultimately to be light in the darkness and to make disciples, to, to seek to to share the love of Jesus. If, if you do this, here's what's going to happen. You will be misunderstood. This is what we see here. But in him, you have your purpose, and you've got to decide, students, listen, now, today, how are you going to live your life? Not when you get on campus, not when you finally get there, because here's the thing. When you proclaim Jesus as Lord, even in the way you live, he is my Lord, my schedule different, my life's a little different because Christ is Lord of my life. I don't do what everybody else does. You're going to be misunderstood. But it is the purpose that God's given you, and it's where the joy is found. And here's the thing. When you live as Christ as Lord, proclaim him as Lord, that, that's misunderstood and even challenged because if he's Lord, then you are not. Then the autonomous self is not Lord. Then there is another Lord outside of me who's guiding my life. He's the source of my life. Look at verse 3. And they arrested them and put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. Now, listen, none of your parents want you to get arrested in college. Um, some of your parents got arrested in college, but they don't want you to be arrested. But I'm going to tell you this. As your pastor, I promise you, if you get arrested in college because you've been proclaiming Jesus as Lord, I will personally come with your parents to get you out of jail. I promise, especially if you go to Pepperdine in Malibu, and I will come and get you <laughs> out of college. I'm serious. Hold me to that. If you're put in jail for all the right reasons, I'll come get you. Uh, if not, you're on your own. Okay, um, <laughs> verse 4. Verse 4, look at this. But many of those who had heard the word believed. And the number, now listen, this is worth noting. We're often afraid, like, well, you know, people, I'm going to be misunderstood. Even the pastor told me that. I don't like to be misunderstood. I don't want to face that. No, they're proclaiming the gospel, and many are believing. Don't miss that. Many, many lives are changed. 5,000 men. And on the next day, their rulers and elders... Scribes, yeah, these are just religious leaders. Okay, all the, I mean, the big wigs like Anna, uh, Annas, the high priest, Caiaphas, and others. And they all come together and they put these guys in front of them. I mean, this is like a trial that continues. This is the same trial that Jesus was up against. Some of the same people. And now they, they're going to put these guys in front of them. Here's the thing. If you live for Jesus, this is for everybody in the workplace, in your neighborhood, in the classroom, in your sorority, in your fraternity. If you live for Christ, you're going to cause quite a stir. If nothing else, you're going to be a real curiosity. And with everybody who's following everybody else, this is the irony of this, this generation, or for all of us. I will live my life. I will you know, self-identify. I will be this. I will not follow anyone else. And we follow everybody else. You want to live a different life. You live with Christ as Lord of your life. And so they call them forth. Now, here's what I want you to see. You will be misunderstood. Not only that, I'm just speaking truth. You will be challenged. 
You will be challenged on the college campus, even persecuted, but take courage. In him you have found your purpose. You will not be shaken. You will be resilient because you know who you are in him. And you will stand firm. Look at verse 7. And when they had set them in the midst, I mean like put them right there. They're, They're interrogating them. They inquired, by what power or by what name do you do this thing? This is very intimidating. Then Peter says, and it look, I like this. Then Peter filled with the Spirit. We see this phrase over and over again in the book of Acts. And always it's followed by great boldness. Fill with the Spirit. And if you've received Christ, you have the same Spirit in you. Living in you. Filled with the Spirit. Said to them, rulers and people of the elders. Okay, all of you bigwigs. If any, or if, if we are being examined today concerning a good deed done, to a crippled man by what it means to be, you know, that he's been healed. He's going to go on to say, Jesus, which is kind of strange, right? Jesus of Nazareth did this. Wait, Jesus? Why? How did he do this? But look at what's happening here. He, he, he's saying, it's Jesus. He's saying, if your accusation against us is that we've brought hope and healing to this man, then come at us. I mean, you're saying that a good thing was done, and now you're asking us, you're challenging us. And here's my point. Young people, listen. You will be misunderstood. You will be challenged, but watch this. You will be known for doing good. Christians are known for a lot of things these days. You will be known for doing good because you are going to love God and love others as Christ has loved us. This is our call into the world to be a faithful presence wherever he puts us. They can question us. They can think we're crazy. They cannot believe or whatever else, but may they know us for doing good in the world. And I praise God that we're a church that has sought and continues to seek to do good in the world, to be known for doing good. Look at verse 10. Let it be known to all of you. Look how bold he is. And so all the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, this is his message, God sent Jesus, you crucified him, you're accountable, repent. That's basically his outline. I could preach that every week, I guess. Um, Whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man is standing before you well. So he is being bold to say, this is what's happened Let Christ be glorified. So here's the thing. Let your friends, your roommates, your classmates stand as evidence that God has worked in your life and through your life. I've thought about this. What if, and I've talked to, we got some college students here, some of the college students graduated yesterday and others who are here for the summer going back. Uh, Listen, what if after four years, if you're going off to college, what if after four years right now, you determine There'll be a day when you're going to be standing there with your diploma. Parents, it's going to happen. This is not a terminal illness. They're going to make it. And, and so you're going to stand there with a the diploma. And that, yes, that's why you're going off to college, by the way, to get the diploma. Remember that. But what if, what if you're standing there with those whom you've impacted to the glory of God because they've come to Christ through you? Exhibit A. Y'all think I'm crazy? Look at these people who've been impacted by Jesus because I've sought to live for him and on purpose. Listen, what matters is Jesus because in him you find your purpose. In him, watch this, you find your identity. Your purpose comes out of who you are. And and this may be the greatest challenge that you have. Look at what Peter explains in verse 11. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. This Jesus matters because he's the one who defines who you really are. Students, don't miss this. I could tell you my story of going off my freshman year. Everything that I had put, you know, thought was my identity was gone. And it was then that I found when I had nothing but God, I felt like that I started to learn that he was all that I needed. My freshman year transformed my life, maybe more than any season in my life. Your identity is found in him and who you are in him. You are loved you are, you are enough. You're fully pleasing. You're totally accepted by him. You are completely in him, loved, and that is what is found in Christ, and that never changes. You've got to hold on to that. That is the Christian life. This is our proclamation. Look at verse 12. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Be clear about your salvation. 
It's found in Christ alone. There is no other. And this may be the great challenge for all of us in a growing, secular, relativistic, pluralistic culture. That Christ is the way. Because he alone has made a way. Every other way is that you must be good enough or do something, be smart enough. And don't miss this. In Proverbs 14, 12, it says there's a way that seems right to a man, but in the end it leads to death. The intriguing thing about that verse is not that it leads to death, but that it seems so right. You're going to hear all kinds of beliefs, all kinds of ideologies coming at you. You're going to have to hold on to the word of God. And here's what you must do. Determine today two things. One, go to church the first Sunday you're on campus. Decide today. Not Saturday night. Decide now that that's where you'll be. Because Christian community will be critical in your life. These next four years. And then secondly, spend time with your Savior every single day. We have sought to disciple you and guide you to do so. You can find a great devotional guide, even if it's a short time, every day to be reminded, Lord, remind me who I am. Remind me who I am in you. My identity is found in you. Decide now how you're going to live. Verse 14, look at this. But seeing the man who was healed standing beside them, they had nothing to say in opposition, right? They were like, wait, we don't know what to say about this. Sure enough, here he is. But when they had commanded them to, get, to leave the council, so, okay, get out of here, they conferred with each other. What do we do with these guys? For that a notable sign was done, this man was healed, and everybody knows that we cannot deny it. And then look at verse 17. But in order that it may spread no further among the people, let us warn them, here's their plan, Tell them not to say anything to anybody. So they called him back in and said, hey, we don't want you to speak or teach in the name of Jesus anymore. So listen, you may be challenged not to proclaim or to live for Jesus. But, but look, at what, look at what Peter does. Peter and John respond in verse 19. But Peter and John answered them, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than God, you, you judge. For we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. Again, determine now. Jesus matters because in him you find your purpose. In him you find your identity. And I'll close with this. In him you find your peace. Capital P. Because Christ himself is our peace. He's the one who allows us to be resilient, to remain bold, fearless in the, in the, in the sight or in, sight of, in light of opposition. Look at verse 21. And when they had further threatened them, they let him go, finding there's no way to punish him because of all the people who were, watch this, praising God for what had happened for this man whom this sign of healing was performed was more than 40 years old. He was old. And he had been, had been like this all of his life is the point. Ultimately, the result of our obedience is great praise and worship. They go back to their friends, tell them all about it, and they're like, yes. I mean, they, they say things like, why do the nations rage, rage against him? Do they not know who he is? Who can stand against the Lord's anointed? We've got this. They're emboldened by it. See, this is my great prayer for you, graduates, that, that you will remain faithful to the Lord through trials and loneliness, and you will rejoice. I've got this image of you coming back. Maybe it's a fall break. Maybe it's next Christmas or Christmas Eve. I, I got an image of you coming back and rejoicing with friends, family, over what God has done and how faithful he's been through the difficult times that you'll face in college. Count on it as you trust him and follow him. Look at verse 29. And now, Lord, look upon their threats and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness. While you stretch out your hand to heal, signs and wonders perform through the name of our holy servant, Jesus. Look at what they're doing now. Parents, this is hard. They're not praying, Lord, just protect them. Give them comfort. Give them security. All those are good things. Give them safety. No. And they're not even praying, Lord, would you stop them coming at us so much? They pray, give us boldness so we can continue to proclaim the gospel in the midst of persecution. Because that's where the light is seen. That's how it goes forth. It's always been that way. And so God is calling us for more boldness to proclaim the gospel more. I love what Ephesians 2 says. It says, for he himself is our peace. 
who has made us both one that is all one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility. He came to preach peace to you who are far off and peace to you who think that you're near and close. For through him, we both, that is all people, have access in one spirit to the Father. Acts 4 ends with peace resulting in joy and worship. And in verse 31, it says, And when they prayed, the place in which they had gathered was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, just like emboldened and empowered to continue to speak the word with boldness. Graduates, you've got to decide now, like Daniel, about your age, when he headed off into exile, it says he determined in his heart ahead of time whom he would serve. We all need to decide today that we're going to serve the one who's given us life. He is the one who's given us purpose, he's given us identity, and he's given us peace. So when I think back on my high school days, maybe there were a few things that mattered. Because I was raised in a home where my parents taught me about Jesus. I came to Christ when I was younger. I had people in my life who spoke into my life when I was a high school student. And, and, and even through the good and the bad times, he proved himself faithful. So even in my past mistakes and whatever I went through in high school, that's a part of me as well. Because in those times, I, I discovered over time his grace, his love for me is constant, and he never fails. So young people, listen. You've got what it takes. You have been through the most unprecedented season any high school student has ever gone through in, in America. Junior, your senior year. And I believe you're more resilient than you know. I think you're ready. I think you've got what it takes. I think you're stronger as a result of it. I think you will remain rooted in God's word. You will find Christian community. You will stay true to God and be faithful. You have what it takes because in him you have found your purpose. You found your identity and you found your peace. And in him, the best is yet to come. In him... The best is always yet to come. Let's pray together. Lord God, we give you our lives. All of us here in this room, everyone watching online, everybody in the sanctuary, across our campus, we decide now that we will serve you. You'll be Lord of our lives as we head into this day, as we head in tomorrow, and as these students head off, we send them now as missionaries into the world knowing that we will hold the ropes of prayer and they always have a home here. Lord, we thank you for their lives. We thank you for their parents, for the families. We cover them in prayer and we give them to you now. In Jesus' name, amen.